Hi everyone, Louisa and I have been working hard behind the scenes at the Cinema Cartography. We just launched the House of Tabula, a new home to showcase our artwork here on YouTube. We're committed to staying independent, no sponsorships, 100% fan funded, and your support on Patreon is crucial for this. Patrons receive access to our weekly podcast, Acid is Bad for Business, our five-part composition workshop, all episodes of The Deep Dive, our new Discord server, and much more. Join our art manifesto today. Thank you, and enjoy the show. There's a period in film that displays the almost physical shift between what we know as classical cinema and what we think of as modern. It's not an exact moment, there's no specific film, but there's a sense that during the 1960s, the gradual movement away from formalism into a new kind of cinematic dynamism emerged. Films felt faster, edgier, the experimental was becoming the norm. New rules were established, and though some sought to disregard what came before, most now see the classical and modern style as able to exist congruently with one another. However, few filmmakers from that era emerged having feet strongly planted in both camps, wherein the almost academic approach of the past was mastered alongside a forward-thinking, energetic form of filmmaking. But the filmmaker I believe did this better than anyone else was Sergio Leone. Most known for his Man With No Name trilogy, Sergio Leone made few films, and all were genre pieces. Yet fewer films so successfully reshaped the genre they were in, as well as perfected it. The films of Sergio Leone became a blueprint for a bombastic and ostentatious style of cinema that would influence the likes of Quentin Tarantino, Sam Peckinpah, and Martin Scorsese. He remains one of the few filmmakers that I believe studiers of film should not only watch, but begin their journey with because almost everything about filmmaking can be learned from the work of Sergio Leone. You don't need to look very hard to discern the style of filmmaking of Sergio Leone. It's right in front of you, and it's not trying to hide. Any frame from any of Leone's films tell you exactly who he is as a filmmaker. Everything is large and grandiose, Scale and spectacle is what Leone looks for when making a film. Environments tower over our characters, as grand vistas fade beyond the horizon. A setting is often introduced to us from above, and crowds of people are panned across, so that when Leone shows us something, he shows us everything in its sprawling entirety. Leone tells stories of individuals, but his camera ensures that the totality of humanity is equally on display. Most of Sergio Leone's shooting was done with wide-angle lenses, in many instances using some of the widest lenses available during this era. The wide-angle shot gives a frame more of a gravitas, it makes everything appear larger than it actually is. But what this also does is allow any frame to have a much deeper focus. So rather than our foreground subjects in focus, the subject of the frame is almost everything that can be seen. The panoramic landscapes fly away with seemingly no end, and Leone wants us to bask in the power of seeing a world larger than life itself. However, as much as Leone was known for shooting landscapes, his favourite visual subject was something else. The face. While Leone was shooting monumental scenery with 18mm lenses, he was doing the same with the human visage. Leone's subjects filled the frame. And because he was shooting with wide-angle lenses, that means his subjects would have been right up close to the camera. And you feel it. His figures are imposing. They carry the weight of the world on their face. And our proximity only seems to move closer and closer until we're left with nothing but the human eyes, the mirrors to the soul. So much of Leone's work is composed of shots like this. Deep human eyes filling the screen, staring into you. If the wide shots of the landscapes display some deep emotional resonance, then Leone is correlating the inhabitants of the space of having the same great depth, often juxtaposing the two together, a shot of an immense landscape interrupted 
by the intrusion of a beaten and worn down man. The two coexist, wearing one another's stories on their rugged surfaces. The frames of Leone's work could not be described as anything other than painterly, perfectly composed shots that are textbook examples of all the vital rules of the visual arts. Golden ratio, rule of thirds, geometry. The people of his films serve as shapes and lines that dissect barren landscapes. Tall symmetrical figures emerge from the dust of a violent wasteland. In the blazing sun, a shadow looms over all and a distant threat sits between a trembling hand hovering over a gun. In these brave, loud declarations of image, an image becomes a symbol of itself. Leone's composition is so calculated that his subjects essentially serve as silhouettes. We know which subject is in charge of a scene just on the absolute basics of image construction. Iconography is key for Leone, because every one of his films was a genre piece. Aside from Once Upon a Time in America, which is a gangster film, but equally used as genre tropes, Leone made westerns. But not of the traditional kind. The term that we most often associate with them are the spaghetti westerns. Uh. <laughs> the western genre became the major genre staple of American cinema throughout the 40s and 50s. Directors such as John Ford and Howard Hawks thoroughly established the iconography of the American Western. Their view of the Old West was a romantic one, one wherein the lush colours of Monument Valley served as a companion to the warmth that emanated from the purity of the human condition. Nature and humanity were in tandem to one another, and each is not only looking to survive, but to find purpose. Their stories revolved around the bitter sweetness of living a simple life. Ma'am, I sure like that name, Clementine. This was the standard for the genre up to that point, and it had served to deliver some of the greatest films, not only from this period in the US, but for cinema as a whole. However, by the 1960s, the Western had become a pastiche, with more directors using tropes of the genre for guaranteed financial success sacrificing artistic integrity. The romantic depictions of human sincerity had all but been wiped away, and the Western genre had run its course. It required a fresh lens, and it was here that Sergio Leone entered. Sergio Leone was an Italian, however his films were all about American history, using the genre that most celebrates said history. However, Leone would use the Western to demythologize the constructs of American cinema. Although his films were about the United States, his approach was rooted in the annals of Italian culture. Leone approached genre work with a different perception. Even a filthy beggar like that has got a protecting angel. A golden haired angel watches over him. His notions of genre have more in common with Commedia dell'arte, a style of Italian comic theatre which is dependent on archetypes and audience expectation. Characters in Commedia dell'arte never change throughout plays. There's Il Capitano, Il Dottore, Piero. Characters identifiable through their masks and their costumes. There will never be a style of Commedia dell'arte which goes against these fundamental rules. The characters serve a predetermined purpose. Their role is fixed before the audience are introduced to them. Their image is their character. And the same approach can thus be applied to the work of Sergio Leone. Leone plays on archetypes to the absolute degree, even simply referring to his characters by nicknames, harmonica, angel eyes, noodles, even the man with no name. The characters are essentially objects within the frame, whose characterization is so universal, we know who they are from the moment they appear. Just look at them. Any genre work operates with tropes. However, what distinguished the Spaghetti Western was the melodramatic, almost theatrical portrayal of these archetypes. Leone knowingly subverted audience expectation of Western stereotypes with his own stereotypes. It was a satirization of the form. 
how would outlaws and criminals of this world really act? Isn't it more likely that in this violent landscape, our protagonists would have a more blatant disregard for other people? The approach of Leone is undeniably Italian, where there's more of a celebration of the absurdity of these outlandish scenarios, and it's okay for a character to be lovably awful. It wasn't a western, it was a spaghetti western. For Leone, everything was simplified towards this universality. This economic form of storytelling is the uniting force of his work. When you break down images to their simplest forms, the stories unfold in front of you. An object of insignificance is suddenly filled with importance, so we zoom in on it like our eyes widening. The villain or anti-hero is the one that disrupts the flow of the frame, often taking up the majority of it or dissecting it completely. We never don't know where to look in a Leone picture, because he guides our eyes so masterfully. His use of shapes throughout every single film is something to behold. And if you know no other information about these films, you can still completely understand what's going on. His work is incredibly simple, masterfully crafted. Leone treats images more like one would a silent film. There's a minimalism in his storytelling, only the necessities. Because it returns us to the resurgence of Commedia dell'arte. The audience already knows who these characters are. The images have done enough to affirm that. How do you show a man overwhelmed? Have three imposing figures converging on him as he sits isolated in the distance, surrounded by empty space. Leone's frames are objective, they're binary decisions, good and evil, light and dark, large and small. We deal with absolutes. It's why dialogue is often negated to sound bites. They retain the same mathematical simplicity. Inside the dusters there were three men. So? Inside the men there were three bullets. For Leone, it lay in the spectacle of mythology that a filmmaker celebrates cinema, but in his subversion of the Western, he wanted to establish his own mythology rather than utilise the one already in place. Although there was still respect towards the genre of the past, because there's no way that one could look at the work of Leone and not say that it doesn't rest alongside it. In fact, his work is better understood when seeing its contrast against the genre. He respected the rules as he was rewriting them, using the expectations from what came before in order to deconstruct our perceptions, even down to using Henry Fonda, a symbol of bygone heroism in the work of John Ford, to a callous, irredeemable villain in Once Upon a Time in the West. Broad brimmed hats like this, unidentifiable from a distance, all with rifles in their hands. And then the camera goes in back of one of the characters, and as he comes to a stop, the camera goes like this. And Sergio, the director, was imagining the audience. It's Henry Fonda! <laughs> Although the moniker of Master of Suspense is applied, perhaps correctly, to Alfred Hitchcock, Leone would certainly have been a major competitor for the title. When it comes to the pacing of Leone's films, he popularised a structure which has been incredibly influential today. Take a look at the majority of Leone's works and see how they're structured. A timeline of the overall narrative will appear as a slow burning rise towards an explosive and climactic crescendo, where all the tension of the film converges towards a singular point whose resolution emerges only when the pressure of the film has gone beyond its breaking point. However, what allows this overall structure to be in place is revealed when his films are broken down. Leone's films are actually more akin 
to a collection of multiple crescendos, one after the other. A Sergio Leone film can be described via its continuous set pieces, individual sequences which can be completely separated from the rest of the film and still function within themselves. The chronology of a Leone film is made of distinct blocks of scenes, all of which have a very clear beginning, middle and end. In order to establish these sequences, Leone works through exposition very quickly. A man arrives in a town, sees a wanted poster, and gets to work. The conflict is established, and now the journey is about our investment in reaching the resolution. And to build the tension, Leone never rushes. In for a few dollars more, we see Lee Van Cleef slowly assembling his gun and getting ready to eye his target. All the while, the target is approaching him. There's a ticking clock. Eventually, the shots at his feet are going to get closer. At the beginning of the scene, he had so much time, but that time is running out. Leone's sequences are long, but it's because they're in real time, and that time is always a fabric of the scenes themselves. It's the same for all his sequences. A child chooses between the growth into sexual maturity or if he wants to eat a cake. Time passes slowly, and as the child begins to reconsider, we're there in the moment, feeling time pass and the urge rising. Time and the salient reminder of its passing is integral to all of Leone's work. It's what gives him the ability to wind up his pressure and he grants himself so much time because of his work's simplicity. Look at the narrative of the good, the bad and the ugly. There's money buried in a grave. One man knows the graveyard and the other knows the name of the grave. All the while, a bounty hunter is tracking them. That's all there is, and the three hours following them is the lyrical rousing of this simple adventure to allow for the ultimate resolution in cinematic catharsis. The films burn slowly, but they're antithetical to slow cinema, because so much is going on, it's just unseen. These vignettes of shorter, confined stories create the pacing of Leone's work. After 46 minutes of Once Upon a Time in the West, there have only been four sequences. The opening at the train station, the farm scene with Frank, Jill's journey to the farm, and the tavern sequence. Four sequences after nearly an hour of screen time, from a man who's known for an explosive brand of cinema. But each sequence still operates as its own story. In isolation, they could be followed by a minor credit sequence. In The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, this is actually applied after the character introductions. The elongated time means the reveal of any information in Leone's work is done at the last moment. A stranger walks into a tavern and we all look at him. We see his face, the room falls silent, but we don't know anything about him. There's a mystery until the last moment where Leone again uses simple, imagetic iconography to tell us exactly who this man is. The way Leone reveals information is tied to his editing, and when any sequence reaches its climax, Leone always does the same. We begin at the medium shot. The Americana's dead. Then a piece of information is revealed, changing everything. The medium now becomes a close-up. Another piece of information is revealed. Now we move to an extreme close-up. And then at the last possible moment, the revelation. Once all information has been revealed, we move back to the wide shot. We see this time and time again. Leone guiding our eye, our natural intrigue making these scenes larger. And then when there are no more secrets, there's nowhere left to hide. We return to the wide shot and see everything in a new light. Like the fundamentals of montage theory, the same shot is given a new meaning. And in these wide open vistas, all we do now is wait for that catharsis. The cutting is rapid after we've waited for so long and it's over in an instant. The tension recedes and Leone's masterclass in audience manipulation is complete. <laughs> A 
And with all this said about Image, there's perhaps no greater director to be associated with the medium of sound. With his longtime collaborator Ennio Morricone, Leone's work is often associated with having some of the greatest soundtracks of all time, and just a dissection of the music would be an entire discussion within itself. How motifs are associated with characters, how the hooves of horses in the desert become percussion to the backdrop of some of the most beautifully orchestrated music in the history of cinema. And although individually they are masters of their crafts, the two undeniably elevate one another's works when side by side, with Leone timing these grand reveals to synchronise with the climactic sounds of Morricone's score. But sound design is another thing. Although these majestic soundscapes are what make up the fabric of Leone's sonic tapestries, it's only with his inclusion of silence that they're amplified. The opening 13 minutes of Once Upon a Time in the West is famous for essentially no dialogue and the cyclical, almost hypnotic repetitions of ambient sounds. We're just waiting as time passes, hearing things. At the beginning of Once Upon a Time in America, a phone rings 24 times and we're simply left to have these noises echo around us, reaffirming Leone's dominance over the atmosphere and that he will dictate when the cord is pulled. Sounds are signifiers for Leone and thus they're isolated from their natural habitats. A sound acts as a cue. Its own tune. They represent something, almost like another archetype in itself, so that when Leone removes these sounds from what they really are, they become exaggerated, they become something other entirely. A creaking door is no longer just a creaking door when it's taken from space and time. It becomes more like a heartbeat dictating the rhythm, and a gunshot displays the peaks and valleys of tension acting just like the images, guiding our eyes to that which cannot be seen. Sergio Leone is one of those rare filmmakers whose filmography can truly teach about the craft of filmmaking. Many filmmakers are great, but few master the absolute fundamentals to a level like he did. But what I want to leave with is the idea that just because his work retained its simplicity, did not by any means make them shallow, in fact quite the opposite. Leone didn't have any fluff on his work. Every frame, every character was exactly what it needed to be. They were so well calculated that emotions within them never stagnated. Everything in a Sergio Leone film serves to elevate the other components. It's a moving piece of art where all the pieces are symbiotic. And though he worked with the genre most associated with satirizing the American sheen, his work carries a sincerity and its sweeping grandiose gestures are there to invoke emotion in the viewer. Stories of loyalty in a world of violence, a dying breed of people in a changing world, or even just anti-heroes trying to make it through one day at a time. The work of Sergio Leone is filmmaking at its purest absolute technique with the aim of visual splendour. He's both modern and classic, cliched and purely original. The definition of a filmmaker.